Uh, we're inc dude, I'm incredibly excited to be here with you. Uh, first of all, we're live right now, so I want to uh, thank everybody for showing up with this live broadcast and hang out with Mike Cooch. Mike, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of the day to uh, hang out with me for a few minutes. Absolutely. Thank you. This is fun. It's my, my first hangout. I'm fired up. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, what I want everybody to know is, is um, whenever I recommend anybody or anything, it is purely vetted by my company and me personally. And so everything that um, I've ever sold, everything that I teach and train on, isn't something I built for someone else. It's really what I built for me and my own company. And what I try to do is extend what already works um, in my own company to others so they can use it so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. I've literally ran my head into so many brick walls. Uh, I lost a lot of hair doing it. And so I don't want others to go through that same experience. And so, you know, when it comes to who I follow, um, who I listen to, those that mentor me and give me advice and mastermind with, um, it, I, I want to release the, that information to you as well because I think sometimes for me, you know, when Michael uh, Gerber mentioned me, I, you know, I, I heard some things and then, you know, John Maxwell would say something like, oh, that makes sense to me. It just kind of clicks. So I think when you hear from other people and get trained by them, you know, that you might have heard it before, but it really didn't click. And Mike Cooch is one of those guys that just makes it click. He makes the, the most sophisticated things look so simple and more importantly, um, appear so simple to do because he has a great um, ability to take a very sophisticated, very difficult, hard things, make them incredibly simple. So, Mike, uh, can you give everybody just a little bit about who you are and local collapse and the, the type of impact that you've been able to make in the local marketplace? Sure, sure. Well, I appreciate you saying that, David. That's um, nice of you to say. I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, I love working with people that are teaching in this industry but that are also operating in this industry. I think that makes a real difference in the quality of you know, content and, um, and the, the lessons that you learn that you can you know, hopefully pass on to other people um, because it's real. You're doing it every day. Um, so I, I feel the exact same way about you and your business. Um, I love you know, the things that you're doing that come from real experience. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, my background, um, I've been an entrepreneur now essentially my you know, entire career. And um, I've, I've pretty much always just exclusively sold to the small business community. I mean, that, not, not by any grand plan, but I kind of fell into that when I was in my early 20s. And um, that started with an IT services company. And, um, you know, to, to sell those services and grow that business successfully, which we did, it was all about marketing. I mean, we had endless numbers of competitors in that industry, I mean, everybody that knows how to fix a computer can go out there and sell their time for a hundred bucks an hour, pretty much anywhere around America, and make pretty decent money. So you have lots and lots of competition, and it was the marketing, it was the local marketing that really differentiated us in that space. Um, and I had, you know, by the time I sold that business, David, I actually had a, a good number. You know, I had about forty employees, very technically oriented. So a lot of this new marketing, you know, doing things online and you know, running pay-per-click campaigns and designing landing pages, theoretically should have been pretty easy for me because I had all of these technical resources, but it was still so tough that I realized, man, if it's this tough for me and I love this stuff, hmm. how tough is it for the guy who owns a restaurant or who, who, you know, the chiropractor or whatever who don't have any of these technical resources? So I started Kutenda. Um, Kutenda is my local marketing services company. We grew that um, very quickly, and then that evolved into Local Income Lab, where we now teach people in this community, you know, how to do the same. And so, talk a little bit about uh, Local Income Lab. You had a huge impact in helping people that are in the very beginning, uh, really understand. Maybe they bought a WSO, maybe they bought a program from you or me, or maybe someone else. And and you had a huge opportunity to really help them from a, a perspective of getting started and really help them get clarity on how to actually go from zero to making a really great living with online uh, local, you know, local marketing. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I think hopefully in helping people get started and, and that, you know, that's the big challenge for most people is just getting that initial momentum, right? So it's all about what can we do to get that initial momentum. And I think there are, there are a couple of things that if you understand that are like really critical to success when you're selling to small businesses, then that makes everything easier. And there's a couple of things to me are one, 
sales and marketing is pretty much everything, right? I mean, it's, it's how good are you at getting the attention of other te people, generating leads, getting deal flow going, right? And it's funny, I mean, we should know that because that's what we, we teach to our clients, right? Is that that's right. what they need to be doing more of is sales and marketing. The second thing is that it is very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to be really effective at all that sales and marketing and also really effective at all of the technical service delivery if you're trying to do it all yourself. And so if you, if you combine those two things, then I think if, then you know, you should understand, okay, what I really need to do is focus like crazy on the sales and marketing and then hopefully outsource or hire somebody to do all of the other, you know, work that, you know, needs to be done. Um, and that's why, you know, I always, I, I always tell people, you know, stick with a system that works. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Find somebody else who's already doing what you're trying to do successfully and, and then just, you know, replicate it. You know, that's um, key to success, I think. Well, so, so let me break that down because I, what you said is, again, very sophisticated but very simple. Um, everything is about sales. And I, you and I agree on one thing, and I think those that are listening right now, is if you're not doing this right now, the key to the sales side is to stay in the sales side as long as possible before yeah. you have to fulfill anything. And yeah, I talked to a, um, a really good friend of mine, his name is Robert Craven, he's done a venture capitalist. He runs a $30 million firm, the CEO, and he built several companies from a $2 million take to $20 million. So he knows what he's doing, and I was having a conversation with him and said, you know, I'd like to one day get to that level of my business. Yeah. What do I really need to focus on? How do I build a team? And his first thing to me was build a team. Don't even think about building a team. What you need is sales. You put yeah. your head down and you do everything you need to to sell, sell, sell. The yeah. fulfillment will take care of itself. You have enough resources out there and a partnership, strategic alliances. You'll figure that out. But until you figure out the sales side of your business, you won't even think about, you know, that you can't even get big. It's not even possible to get big. It just kind of it kind of crushed me to like wow, I was thinking about this, you know, building leadership and a team and and, and it, all he did said sell, sell, sell. So I actually yeah. put my head down, and um, I got to my business to a certain amount, and and I kept focusing on selling. And what I did is I think this is interesting. I've never really talked to this, uh, about this too much to anyone, but I'd like to hear your take on it. And then everything switched. And my business started to shake a lot. It was like, you know, like you're in a car and all of a sudden like one wheel's on balance. <laughs> yeah. And the sales side was going so well that I didn't have the infrastructure. I didn't have the team. And yeah. so what I realized was it was like a blink of an eye almost. It felt like that way. That this once I really focused on sales and got that ramped up, then all of a sudden my business needed leadership. It needed systems. It needed management. And I'm like, how did I even get here? Like, I woke up one day and went, holy cow. So what I, my big kind of aha moment was I tell everybody that I teach and train, it's two hours a day, direct relationship to marketing tasks. And then what I realized was as soon as you get to a certain amount of money, and I, I'm just going to throw out the number between 10000 right around the $10,000 a month. So that means you've got maybe five or six clients, seven clients, $1,000 a month. Plus, you're bringing in two or three clients at a thousand dollars a month, so you're right around that six, you know, figure mark, right around there. You got to make sure that your both the tenacity you had on, on on marketing switches over to management, leadership, development of people, hiring the right people. Um, I, I know we're talking about sales, but could you kind of give your input on it? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think. I think that's totally, I think it's right on. Um, you know, one of the smartest guys that I know in this industry said that, you know, what somebody getting started should do is do nothing but sell for 30 days straight. I don't know if, I don't know if you know who that is, David. That was you who said that. Um, and, and I think that that's, I think that that's absolutely brilliant because um, what way too many people I see in this industry tend to do is they want to have all the answers. They want to have everything perfectly laid out before they go and they do anything. And it's that perfectionism that, that that's actually what we teach is one of the you know mental challenges of, of sales is perfectionism. And it's because you feel like you have to have everything perfect before you ever go out and get a deal. And the problem is, you know, you'll meet people in this industry that go for six months without selling anything because they're still trying to get everything perfectly lined up. They want all of the answers. Well the reality is 
you know, that saying, nothing happens in, until a sale is made, you know, you've got to just get momentum as fast as you can because that momentum will solve the biggest problem. And the biggest problem is cash flow, right? That's, that's the biggest problem of any small business. You just need to get money coming in the door, right? Right. And it will create all kinds of new problems, which is what you just described. It's like, oh, wait a minute. All of a sudden, you know, like you said, the car is shaking and I think the wheels are going to fall off. Well, I call that a good problem, right? <laughs> a bad problem a bad problem is when you don't have any cash coming in. A good problem is when you have so much cash and so many sales coming in that other things start to break. Um, and, and I totally agree with you that that's when you need to make sure that you start putting some operational maturity in place. And I think you know the smartest thing I did in my previous company in particular at, at uh, Everon, my IT services company, is that my very first hire was somebody whose entire job was just to take care of the clients and make stuff work. Like you, you don't have to do anything with sales, anything with marketing, anything. That's 100% my job. So you you take care of all that other stuff. And I, I, I recommend that that's what people do as early as possible is they get somebody whose entire focus is dedicated to making the whole service delivery and customer care side of the business fire on all cylinders, just like you're trying to get your sales and marketing side to fire on all cylinders. Now, I love about what you said when it comes to the, the, the 30 days, the, the focus for that, um, because that, that's momentum. Um, and then the first hire you want to do is actually make more of an, you're not hiring them for operations, but pretty much a client manager. And, and here's a big shift that in my business that happened recently. I was just on a mastermind. Actually, I brought my client manager on the mastermind and start interviewing her live in front of everybody because um, she isn't she's um, she's an extrovert but she's a, more of a, a feeler perceiver she's not motivated as much by money uh, mm -hmm. she's more motivated by based on relationships and what I realized was is in my business is that things were happening um, with my customers and I wasn't it, 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 the support was more of an expense and that's why I was looking at it. And so that, that customer support person, what I realized is if I had to do it all over again, instead of hiring a support person, I probably would have hired an inside sales person. Because yeah. what I want to do is I just, I want to sell that person, get my foot in the door in the first 30 days. And then when I start fulfilling, I want to funnel for the next 30 days and the next 60 days, next 90 days to be able to upsell them to the next product and the next service. So I'm just not making 750 or 1000 or 2000 dollars a month. I can turn that client into a three or four thousand dollar a month customer because, but I've got someone that's going to manage them that's excited about making more money, that's excited about looking at their business and and connecting with that person, really understanding the problems, so we can give them another service and another service and another service, and therefore we're doing two things. Number one is we're growing. We're genuinely, like you said in the very beginning, we're genuinely growing their company. We're really um, we're we're focused on helping them. And connecting with them and really becoming more like their what I like to say is their VP of online marketing. So that's yeah. kind of my vision is is a client manager would eventually be like the VP of online marketing. We take a look at their problem, we try to solve that problem, and then we grow their business and turn our business and grow because they'd stay with this just not for a, a year or, or two years, but literally it'd be impossible for anybody to get their foot in the door because we have multiple services with them. So I think a lot what a lot of people do, and getting back to the sales side is they think they got to identify every single problem up front because they bought four WSOs and six programs and haven't sold anything first. They got to, they got to bring all those problems to the table, try to solve all those problems. And, and here's what I you typically say is the more problems you find, the longer, the more products you're going to sell them, the longer it is for them to make a decision and the less chances you are of getting money in your bank account and really connecting and making a difference with that business. So, so what are your what are your thoughts on the the you know all these different products um, and, and maybe the be the better products to lead with? Do you have any insights on that? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I think you're right on. I mean, yeah, the the more complicated the conversation is during the sales cycle, the longer the sales cycle, right? It it overwhelms people and. You know, I think we, we live this stuff every single day. We breathe it, you know, eat it, drink it all day, every day. And so, you know, pretty soon you're sitting there talking about, 
reputation management, marketing, and SMS, and you know this and that, and and that will make a normal person's eyes glaze over because they have no idea what the heck you're talking about. So you you go and throw too much at them, and they will just kind of shut down. And you know, there's that saying, a confused mind doesn't buy, right? So you don't want to confuse your client too much. Um, you know, uh, we teach. You know, you're familiar with our R4 sales and marketing system. We teach. We teach communicating to businesses that it takes optimization of four R's for any business to grow, any local business to grow, right? And we say that the it's it's the shape of a pyramid. And the base of that pyramid is reputation, right? You've got to have a strong reputation um, for delivering products and services and being the type of company that people want to work with. Reach. You have to reach out to more people. You have to let people know about you and your business, right? Resell, which is just, um, uh, you know, resell, cross-sell, upsell, so that like you talked about, once you get a client, you want to do more with them and, and sell more products and services to them. And then the fourth R is referral. If you do all of those things right and you deliver a great product or service, you're going to get more referrals. And what that does is that feedbacks around and enhances your reputation, right? So, you know, that, that that's four things, and it's pretty easy for uh, a mind of a business owner to be able to digest, okay, I just need to work on four things to make my business work. And it's normal, common language. We're not using autoresponder and SMS and, you know, this and that. It's just normal, common language that anybody can get. So we start with those, you know, we teach people to start with that conversation. And then, you know, look for the most glaring and obvious weak spot with that client to be able to help them and help them fast. Right, so you can get quick results to try to uh, make a real strong impression with that client. Um, and you know, no surprise to you, I'm sure, with all the reputation marketing, you know, work that you do, is that reputation right now is is obviously one of the you know, if not the biggest opportunity. And and I think, you know, and I hate to use the word the the phrase paradigm shift because it sounds you know like some marketing or management guru you know phrase or something that's kind of empty but but I think it is it is a real shift for people to understand oh geez my reputation is publicly visible for the world to see and not only that but publicly visible for the world to participate in and comment on and create content around like a lot of that stuff is out of my hands because there's so many people out there they can just create a video now and tell the world what they think about my business and post it online, right? So I think when, when people realize that, that's oftentimes a real big, you know, first opportunity to work with people. Um, and that's, that's not always the case. I mean, I teach people, hey, you should look for the obvious spot in that person's business where you can get the highest impact, the fastest, so that you can demonstrate a win with that client right away. Now, so out of all the different products that you've seen in the market, um, is it is it? And by the way, I love the fact that that um, it, it's it's not linear; it's reciprocal. So if you start with reputation and then you come back to referral, that enhances your reputation again, and that to me is where you go deeper. So it's almost like you, you know you're kind of going around the uh, you know around the circle, yeah. and then that's kind of like your. And then you can go deeper and deeper and get more entrenched in their business and really make a, you know become a fundamental force to helping people uh, with their businesses. And, and for me, my vision I think is a lot different than people that create WSOs and maybe give people these little shiny objects because I, my mission and vision is to take the gifts and the experience that God's given me and to be able to go out and make a difference and make a difference to everyone every day and everywhere when it comes to the local marketplace because in my opinion if you want your local economy to grow you want to support your local church your local charities then you need to invest in the business leadership because it's the business leaders that build buildings that give to charities that go on and put you know things together and so every time I impact a business I know because over 90 percent of small businesses are a little bit under that I should say are, are really families they're family owned small businesses less than 10 employees that's a real family that you're yeah. impacting because that owner has a family. They're they're employing a few local other families as well. They're bringing products and services to really um, to help solve a problem in the marketplace. So there's nothing I get excited more than than to see that that really great product or service 
and then be able to shout at the mountaintop because I've been able to enhance their business to get them to be able to help more people to solve their problems. So there's a mirror image of between what my business is doing and wanting to solve problems and how I'm passionate about helping them solve their problems as well. And so when it comes to this, this you know kind of cycle thing, um, you know that you, you talked about where it's making sure that each individual part is taken uh, or is started with or, or followed up with. When you start with referrals, and then you said the next one is what? Or I'm sorry, reputation. reputation. The next one is next one is reach. The reach. Right. Okay. You need to reach out to more people and let them know about your business and your products. Yep. So when you're sitting down with someone, how do you how do you identify which one is the big glaring omission or the one is the most obvious? So, yeah. So we use um, as a marketing system that is just it's just, it's a questionnaire. It's a simple questionnaire ah. that you know ask ask people, hey, are you doing these things? Do you have these things in place? And that audit reveals a lot. It, you know, it reveals a lot to you as the salesperson, but it also re reveals a ton to the business owner because they can see for the first time, oh, geez, look at all these things that I'm not doing that I should be doing for my business. Um, so, you know, we, we use a tool like that, and, and sometimes it's glaringly obvious, right? Um, you know, you, you can look online, search for a business, and see that, you know, out of 50 reviews, you know, 40 of them are negative and, you know, awful and they have a, you know, a, a terrible rating on, you know, Google or Yelp or whatever it is, right? So sometimes it's glaringly obvious. I mean, hey, look, if you've got a terrible reputation, it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of marketing reaching out to new prospects. Right. You're just driving them back to your terrible reputation, right? <laughs> so that, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So sometimes it's obvious, but, but we use that audit tool and, and I think, like I said, just as important the audit tool teaches you what you can do for the client, but it also teaches the client what needs to be done, which many small business owners don't know that, right? I think that's brilliant, man. The fact that you, uh, to me, that's an aha moment going, oh my goodness. Instead of me telling them, uh, you know, the person that's in control is the one asking the question. So ask them questions, use a brilliant system um, to really reveal the problems and allow them to see it for themselves as opposed to you, you telling them. And what do exactly. what are people what type of success are you seeing with the audit tool that, that you you've developed in in a, a newbie person someone that's brand new they really don't have the language yet they're a little yeah. confused on what product to sell or what to lead with or they never maybe even you know maybe they were a manager at a company never really sold before um, then be able to sit down and use an audit tool can you give you a little maybe behind the scenes of how helpful that can be yeah yeah I mean so. I think I think the key distinction um, that I realized here over the last year in trying to help people, David, is that there's all kinds of training that we can do, but there's a big difference between sales training and a sales system. And training is, is kind of it's still up at this theoretical level, right? You should ask somebody smart questions to move the conversation forward. Okay, I, I know that you know that you know that's a, a fundamental of good selling, right? But if, if I just tell somebody that and I don't give them the specific questions and the specific language to use, then they still struggle with it because they leave that training and go, well, well what questions do I ask? You know, what, what are the right questions? So in our particular you know, sales system, we, we map everything out. I mean, we, we give them conversation by conversation. Here's the script. Here are the questions. And then the audit tool, again, it's, it's these you know, predefined questions that you can just hand to somebody. And I think that that, I think that that takes a lot of the fear out of people's minds because you've given them, you know, you've given them the language the entire way to use, and I think that that's that's really important. Um, you can't you can't give everybody everything, right? Uh, inevitably, when you're talking to a prospect, the conversation that you wanted to go this way will go this way, and you'll have to you know try and course correct and get it back on track. So you can't give everybody every single detail but what you can give is a nice framework and structure to follow that as they get more comfortable with it it, it becomes easier and easier so that's the approach we take and, and you know in that audit I'm, I'm thrilled to see people you know every day come back and they're like you know I sent somebody to the audit and they they sent me back you know a note saying geez we're terrible when do we get started you know <laughs> um, 
Because again, it, it opens that client's eyes to, oh my gosh, yeah, look at all these these sensible things that we should be doing to marketing for our business that we're not doing. No, that is amazing. I, I've never used an audit myself. I, a lot of it's in my head, is experience. And, and when I script in people, it's more of towards a specific product. But because you're thinking holistically, which I think has been um, a critical misstep in my own business, is I thought very, um, very focused on maps marketing, reputation marketing. We really haven't gotten into you know a resell or upsell or going deeper with the company. And I'm on to the next customer. And you know my first thought was do one thing really really well. And so we're doing maps. We do reputation really well. But you know then I'm in a decision making mode of going okay I've got 40 clients or I've got four clients. Doesn't really matter. Do I want to go out and get four more or 40 more? Or would I rather double my income from each one of those and really understand up front? And what I love about probably your audit too is is you're not, you know, like we talked about lower, we're not selling everything to them even though we've identified. You're saying identify the number one glaring omission that they have that you can really fix. Obviously start with reputation. But now you've almost set the entire game plan up for 60, 90, 180, six months down the road to slowly take care of and really help them with their entire overall approach to their marketing to really help their business grow. And if you do that on day one, from moment one, oh my gosh, you're like setting everything up perfectly. Am I no, off on no, that? Or I, that I think that you're exactly right. And, it, and it's interesting because there's a balance. Because like you said earlier, you don't want to overcomplicate the sales process because then you can drag things out and you know people can get overwhelmed. Um, but at the same time, I, I have found personally that the greatest success that you can have in selling to that small business is setting the stage up front for that long-term relationship that you described. The more you do that from the very beginning, the easier it is. So what, what I teach people is that if, if you come in and you have a conversation like the one that I described where you say, hey, small business owner, let me teach you that there are four fundamental things that every local business can do to grow their business and here are these four things. When I have that conversation, I come across as an expert. I come across as an advisor and I don't come across as a salesperson trying to pitch one thing. So it differentiates me from the, from the very get-go from all the people that are selling, right? I'm going in there and I'm advising. And in fact, if, if at the very beginning of the conversation they said something like, well, Mike, what should I do? I would say, well, I don't know yet. I mean, let's step back and talk about these four fundamental things and see where it is that you need the most work, and then we'll prescribe a specific solution. So when I, when I do that, I've set the stage now that they now know about that whole pyramid. They know about the big picture, and they know that I'm an advisor on the big picture with specific tactical solutions. So now, like you said, in the evolution of that client, as soon as we're done with one, it makes sense to now look at, okay, well, what was number two? And let's work on that, right? So I, to me, like I said, there, there's I lots it. of ways to do this, but to me, that's what I think has worked and created the greatest long-term value is that I've positioned myself from day one with that prospect as a strategic advisor on how to market and grow their business. So, so everybody listening right now, this is I, I'm just stoked after listening to what you just said because again, the most sophisticated things Mike makes simple because what he simply said was is you got one chance to make a first impression. Um, when you're talking to a company for the very first time, you can either be the painted or the painter. And there, if you say you're a marketer, you're an accountant, you're a realtor, they're gonna think, yeah, I know. You know, my aunt's one. You know, I know three of those. I know six of those. They already paint, painted you. But if the words that come out of your mouth are a consultant, more of an advisor approach, and you say something like, we've cracked the code to helping businesses double or even triple their income with a four-step uh, four or a four-different target you know, approach to their marketing, mm -hmm. and you go over what Mike just said, you instantly become the painter. You paint the picture for them. They have never even heard of someone like you before because you have a full grasp of, of their business, but much better than they do in the first conversation, and they're going to be intrigued to want to know more. So if you change your language, you change your business, and Mike, I love 
that language. The more and more about the four R that you tell me, the more excited I get because it's doing so many things. It's number one, it's changing your language up front from salesperson wanting to sell you a shiny object. And even reputation is kind of a shiny object if you leave it all by itself and you don't come with the consultant approach. Um, number two is you've set the opportunity up for a long-term relationship. We're just not going to fix one thing. We're going to be, again, like I like to say, your vice president, of, don't say this up front, we're your VP of online marketing because they don't want to hire a VP. It sounds very expensive. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's the mentality that you have to have. Yeah. But you've set all that relationship up so instead of being a one-trick pony, you know, you're an advisor, you're a consultant, and you really um, have set yourself apart from everybody else. So what I want to do is, and Mike, I want to thank you so much. You got shared some amazing stuff, but I've never done this before, but what I want to do is go through more like a 60-day um, a process, and let's just check in with each other, and let's discuss like um, week one, week two, week three, week four type of thought process, maybe some yeah. numbers. And so let's start off with product. Okay, if you're going to yeah. lead... Um, let me just kind of hit your heart on this. If you're going to lead with, without really even knowing, um, uh, you know all the different products out there, but just your experience. If you're going to lead with one, maybe two products, that's the easiest to sell, kind of the great foot in the door strategies that really connects with people. It, it, it's a, it's not like a me too service. Can you give the maybe one or two products that you would lead with or suggest people to lead with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think part of that um, depends on you know what industry you're selling into and things like that. So I'll, I'll just I'll just caveat that a little bit. Um, but I would say um, so you know in anything one I, I look for where somebody is currently in pain, mm -hmm. right? How can I get them out of pain? If I can get them out of pain, then I've won, right? I've I've won. I've created a long term you know valuable relationship. The other thing is I just look for something where I can hopefully have a very fast impact because the last thing that I want to do is have somebody spend thousands of dollars with me over the course of months and not be able to see yep I got a result because of because of that right so that being said uh, I think that there's a, a few things so one as I said before I think reputation if somebody has a bad business reputation it's so um, it's such an emotional hot button I mean, to, to be able to go and show somebody online, hey, did, are you aware of all of the things that people are saying about you? You know, and, and that this information is so publicly visible. Like when somebody sees that and learns that, it's like it just it makes your blood boil and your skin crawl and all of those negative things, right? So I think that that's just a super, super, super powerful opportunity. Um, so, you know, looking for people, looking for businesses that have – uh, a bad reputation um, is is a real you know obvious opportunity I think um, the other things that I would look for are um, where people are completely underutilizing their existing asset so what what I mean by that um, I think um, you know there there's a couple companies out there that have done very very well by effectively just offering text message marketing and setting that up on behalf of a client because the client, let's say it's a chiropractor or a restaurant or something like that, their asset is that they have this physical location where they have customers coming in and out every single day. They have a, they have a real live human connection with these people who are walking in and out of their place of business every day that most of those businesses are doing nothing to capitalize on. They're not collecting that phone number or maybe they're collecting it and doing nothing with it or the, that email address and they're doing nothing with it. So, you know, oftentimes in those businesses, you can make a dramatic impact overnight just by saying, hey, look, you've got this asset of customers. All you need to do is reach out and communicate to them once this month with some sort of offer or reminder or whatever it is to get them to come back in and spend more money with you. So setting something like that up for uh for a client, I think is oftentimes a, a real obvious fast opportunity. <laughs> Dude, I love love what you have to teach and train. Um, I, I want you guys to, to hear one thing. Those of you listening, to, number one is that what what Mike described is really leading with what's the most important thing to their business, which are their assets. And make no mistake about it, their reputation is an asset to the company. Yeah, and their list is an asset. Matter of fact, uh, this is a you, know, you talked about the, the, the four, your 4R strategy and changing your language. 
and kind of how do you position yourself as a, an accountant, or I'm sorry, a, a, an accountant, Advisor, a, yeah. a consultant. Um, yeah. So let me get, I want to, I'll give you my kind of secret um, language on how I take a big CEO that kind of knows his stuff and just flip them on its head. I mean, it works 100% of <laughs> the time. Here's what I say. So, um, so you know, and we're in a conversation, I said, well, well let me ask you, um, you know, what do you think the most valuable um, part of your company is? What's the most valuable thing about your company? And typically they'll, they'll sit back and they'll look at me and they'll be like, well, you know, they have to think through the process because I think number one is um, they already know that I'm asking them a question that they need to answer correctly. And then number two is, you know, uh, a CEO thinks everything's important. You know, it's me, it's my technology, it's my service, it's all that. And so, um, so I just sit back and, you know, let them talk for a few seconds. And they'll typically say, like, our products or our service or even our reputation. And my rebuttal to that is, and this is where I gain instant credibility, is, well, that's what I thought when I actually first started my company, too, that my business or my technology or my systems or my whatever was the greatest asset. But what I realized was the number one asset of my company in your company is your list. And I just, I, say, I don't say anything. Uh, they get this like weird, and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 the list. Yeah, yeah, the list. I said, let me prove this to you because they're still not convinced at that point because it's just so simple. Yeah. If you were to sell your company, and you know this for a fact because you bought and sold, I mean, bought and sold, I'm sorry, you developed companies and sold companies. Yeah. Um, if you sell your company, what's the number one factor that your company gets um, sold by based on what it's worth. It's revenue. Where does your revenue come from? Doesn't come from your great customer support. That's a part of it. Doesn't come from you as being an amazing CEO. That's a part of it. Yeah. It comes from your list. Your list of at your list of customers, previous customers, strategic alliances, um, you know, supply chain management, whatever you got on that list. So then they're like, oh, yeah, you know what? I, I agree with this. So all of a sudden, I differentiate myself from salesperson to consultant, and then I just drive the stake a little bit deeper. I said, so if your list is the most number one asset of your company, what's the second most valuable asset of your company? And at this point, tip, most of the time, they don't say anything. They're like, what? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going to play that game anymore. So just so you know, just don't let them even answer. Just kind of roll with it. And I say, it's your relationship to the list. Because you could have done $2 million this year, but if you didn't build a really good relationship with that list and you sold it, the next person that owns your company, they're going to have an awful year because no one wants to do business with you anymore. So the number one asset is your list, and the second is relationship to that list. And yeah. then it's game on. Then they say, you know what, David? I've really never thought about it clearly like that before. And so yeah. what you've got to talk about and you know, what you're saying is so brilliant, um, Mike, because when it comes to that list, just like you said, there are easy ways to engage the list, to build a relationship with the list, that anybody can help them out almost instantly and drive revenue. And yeah. that's an amazing foot in the door strategy. I don't teach any of those strategies. So um, I, I think it's brilliant that you do, because that's a whole, very holistic approach to actually getting, you know, to, uh, to, to making huge profits and be able to gain customers where they're not so excited about SEO, they really don't understand text message marketing or they did that before, um, they tried social media, spent lots of money on that, you know, and so for you, what I love you to say, it's all about ROI, it's all about generating revenue for them and getting those results fast, so yeah, brilliant insights. That's cool, thanks. I, I love, I mean, you know, the, the language that you're talking about there is, is absolutely right. I mean, that you you totally differentiate yourself, especially in a crowded marketplace, which you know this 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 market is getting more and more crowded. There's people jumping into it all the time. And people shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, it's it's a huge marketplace. I mean just you know a monstrous marketplace. So don't be afraid of that, but do think about how do you differentiate yourself from the competition. And, and just I mean just like you would advise your clients to think about how they differentiate themselves using effective marketing. If you can position yourself from the very get-go as that expert and advisor instead of just the salesperson, it makes all the difference. You establish, like you said, that first impression. You establish 
a level of trust and authority from day one that you know allow you to 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 some extent kind of ride that for years to come, right? So it, it's it's very hard to you know as I say you don't you don't get a second chance at a first impression, right? So it's very hard if you if you mess that up in the beginning or you not even mess it up but don't take advantage of it to its fullest extent to make the impression that you want, then you know, you've know you missed an opportunity. Mike, let's, let's kind of finish this segment by going over some numbers because I think mm -hmm. some people want to get clarity about where they are and how you know what do they need to be doing. So we're just going to advise everybody right now to keep it really simple. We just talked about two things you should be leading with, something that can reactivate their list or something that can engage their list to make money or lead with reputation, the first thing you want to do is find companies with no reputation, which is just as bad as not have a bad reputation, or they have negative reviews that you can really help out and give them some clarity on. So let's say you find those types of companies. What is the type of activity um, that you're seeing that someone should do on a daily basis to get results? Because obviously it's a push button, you buy a program, you sign up for some course, you list some training, all of a sudden you know, people start making money. Tell me the type of activity that you're seeing that, that really gets some good results. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I think that there's a combination of things. So one, I think that you want to be doing stuff that puts you out there as an expert and edu educator and as an advisor all, all the time. So I recommend that people in this space, you know, one, one of the great things about this space is that it's so dynamic. There's so many interesting things that are learning and changing every day. That again, it's our jobs to keep up with. That's what we do every day. But most small businesses look at it and they're just you should be doing webinars on a regular basis. Um, and I think the webinars are pretty much the perfect marketing vehicle. You know, but creating content like this, doing a hangout like this, things like this, where you can demonstrate some expertise and share some knowledge so that people can see you as an expert, as an advisor, right? If their first interaction with you is to sign up and hear you spend an hour talking about these important smart things, that makes an incredible first impression, right? So I think that, that anybody in this industry is crazy if they're not doing things like that on a regular basis, creating that content that establishes you as an expert and as an advisor in the field. And then the other thing that I think you should be doing uh, is is just you know if you, again if you if you move up the R four pyramid right is reach. Too many people in this business are not doing anywhere nearly enough to reach out to enough new prospects consistently. You know every single day. And there's lots of ways you can do that, right? I mean direct mail, email, phone calls. And you know for me, I've always found that a combination of those things is what's most effective. You know any any one thing will get results, but you combine those things together and you'll get 10 times the results. So, you know, we, we do a mix of that, you know, direct mail, phone calls, things like that. Now, now, when it comes to, I love the fact that you said combining them because what it's doing is, is the more you do an activity, matter of fact, th this is my theory, um, is that it, you need to see the exact same activity in a half a day. So if you can redo that same activity in a half a day, you will learn it 10 times faster than if you only do it in a week or two weeks or three weeks. Same with any type of training, when, especially if you're hiring a support person. If you have them to do one thing and they don't see that same activity for another week or two, you might as well forget them learning it. You need to right. position your business where someone will see the activity over and over and over and over again. So one of the strategies that I use is that um, I have people where they, if, when they find leads, no matter how they get the leads, whether they use my software or someone else's software or system, doesn't really matter is they call up on the phone for 30 minutes a day just to confirm the information. That's it. Because what that's doing is that it's kind of tricking them into, into, into first of all, doing, you know, there's no, not a lot of secrets out there. It's just the activity. That's really yeah. the secret. Yeah. Is you call up companies, make sure you got the correct name, correct email address, correct person, and, and, and there's little scripts for that. But we're talking no more than literally like three or four minutes on the phone. But if you do that 10 times, you're like 30 minutes and now you're comfortable. You got all the kind of the, you know, the, the scariness out of picking up the phone um, and really talking to people. At the same time, once you talk to those people, then you got the ability to do things that aren't so 
um, kind of in your face, like a cold call. You, now once you got the correct information, you can send them direct mail, you can send them an email, you can invite them to a webinar. So if you just spend 30 minutes a day getting a list and getting the correct information, and then you use strategies, whatever ones you want, postcards and direct mails and phone calls, uh, uh, um, um, and, and, you know, invitations to events, and you do that 90 minutes a day. So, I, it, like, I've got this, um, I've got this kind of uh, way I categorize everything because I'm really hard on, <laughs> on my members because I'm hard on myself as well. And then I tell them that there are three tasks that they can do every single day, and there are only three. One is no relationship to revenue tasks. One is indirect relationship to revenue, and the third is direct relationship to revenue. And my definition of direct relationship to revenue is only activities where you're communicating, enga engaging, and connecting with human beings. That's mm -hmm. the only type of activity that can be direct relationship to revenue. And so it's got to be 90 minutes minimum a day on direct relationship to revenue. So creating postcard is not direct relation. It's not marketing to me. Right. Email is not marketing. Those are indirect. So, so my suggestion is, is uh, and I just want to go through this timeline real quick, is you can lead with reputation or lead with a, a product that really um, helps uh, the client maybe engage with their list and sell more products or lists. Work on your reputation. Work on you being actually a, an expert in the industry. And then what you want to do, as Mike said, then you, what you want to do is make sure that you've got 90 to 120 minutes, two hours a day, direct relationship to marketing. Um, and you can use those different strategies that we just talked about. And now, some of the numbers I've seen, let me just confirm them with you, is if you're, if you're like hardcore, if you're talking or having small conversations, two to five minutes, you're having... 30 of those. For every 30, you're going to get right around eight, eight um, type appointment types, meaning connections with decision makers. Mm -hmm. So when you're, whether it's administrator, secretary, it's a manager, whoever you're calling, if you talk to 30 people, yeah. you would typically get to about eight to 10 right around there of yeah. decision makers, people that have a conversation. Once you have that conversation, you would typically get, if you've got a good system, you're following it, like Mike or myself, you would typically get between four and five actual what we call presentations or one-on-one -on -one meetings, undivided attention. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you agree with those numbers so far approximately, Mike? Yeah, I think those are good. And then out of those four or five presentations, if you have a good presentation, you have good language, you typically can get typically two or three proposals. You'll get 50% of everybody that you have a presentation with to say, look, I'd like you to propose me on this. I'd like to put a strategy together. Tell me what it costs. Tell me what you can do. Yeah. And if you're really good with a good system and you've got a good process, like Mike said in the very beginning, then you typically close about 25 to 40% of those. So if you're on four presentations, five presentations, you're going to get one or two clients with no problem. So those are the typical numbers as yeah. I look through the process. And, and Mike, your input on that? Yeah, I think I think that that's that's really good. I think that those numbers are are right on. And you know what? I actually I give all my members is a simple spreadsheet that I've used for years that just tracks our daily activity. How many connections did I make? How many conversations did I have? How many appointments did I set? How many proposals did I present? How many deals did I get done? And what what I teach people to do is track that every single day and have specific goals around it every single day for each of those activities. So one, it keeps you on track because you can see have I met my goals. But two, it's very, very educational because you can see the, the percentages on those numbers. You can see the exact things that you're talking about. For every 100 phone calls I made, I connected with 15 people. For every 15 people I connected with, I set the appointment to get the one-on-one -on -one time with them. For every, you know, and you can see the ratios and you can see how those ratios improve over time depending on different strategies that you're trying and testing. Um, so that, 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 that has been a, a tool for me that's been a huge eye-opener for me throughout my career. And is that a database system or just an Excel spreadsheet? How do you do it's that? It's a good old spreadsheet. I'm not a technology whiz like you are making all these <laughs> products. So I would, well, love, I would love to turn it into a real product. Well, here's what we do on our mastermind. It's very simple. And I'm happy to give this out to to people, or or maybe you can think it is. We use Google Docs, yeah. and we have a form at the end of the day. So at yeah. five o'clock, you clock out, you fill in the form, 
And that form right. will actually put all the data in because sometimes the spreadsheet's a little maniacal. Oh, totally. Yep. And then what you're doing is you're you're not you're unbiased when you're filling in the form as opposed to looking yeah. at data that says, well, you know, so as soon as you fill in the form, more importantly, if you hire someone, this is essential because in business, and please everybody listening, write this down. In business, the numbers tell you what to do. Yeah. Always. So yeah. if you're gonna be in business, you gotta know your numbers. So you tell that to another CEO, they're gonna love you. Say, look, we track everything. So because in business, the numbers tell you what to do. And so when you know your numbers, then you've got a process that you can hire someone you know, to follow. So th those are the That's typical right. numbers. Now, you know, we talk about, you, you and I, about not doing anything for 30 days. So let me give yeah. you my language, and then Mike, you can, you can um, you know, give me your insights as well. I typically tell people, if you can get your contract and your, uh, your you know, check-in by Friday, our docket doesn't open up until I typically go out 30 days. So let's say today is you know, February 15th, I wouldn't say, to March 21st. We work with five to six customers every single month because we give unbelievable personalized service. And so we have about, we have two spots left, or four spots left, or five spots left, whatever you want to say. But so our docket opens up then. Now, if you get in past then, our docket would actually probably open up a little bit later. I wouldn't use the word probably, actually. I say it would open up later. Mm -hmm. And so what I typically I get is, well, holy cow, everything you explained, David, can we get, can we start faster? I said, absolutely. But we'd have to move our docket around. We have a fast start program, which is only a hundred, or I'm sorry, only seven hundred fifty dollars more to get mm -hmm. started, and we could probably put you into our docket on the fifteenth, yeah. or the you know two weeks from now. And typically, there's no resistance. I mean, especially if they're with what I teach on reputation. I mean, you haven't had a reputation for five years online. Another thirty days isn't going to matter yeah. that much. Yeah. Or uh, or you've had a bad reputation for three years, and another thirty days isn't going to matter that much. But what it does is what you talk about so early in the, the training here is it pushes that timeline out of when you actually have to fulfill. Yeah. So you get your next client, your next client, your next client, your next client, and you got momentum. And when you got yeah. momentum, I mean, there's nothing that can stop you. And then when you start to fulfill, now you got money that you can hire someone, and that's another part of the story. I mean, right. um, you, you talk about when you hire someone to support, someone that can run your operations, the best thing you ever did. Well, now you've got money to do that, but if you keep doing the, Sale fulfill, sale fulfill, sale fulfill. I mean that 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 track is so long and so hard, and that's why I think a lot of people fail very fast, is because yeah. they just don't have the revenue coming in. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, well, I call that you know that sell fulfill, sell fulfill. I call that the SMB sales cycle of doom, um, and, <laughs> and, and that's what it is. That's what it is. Is that? Well, you know, I was saying, it's, a, it's the what? It's the at S and the the SMB as in small and medium sized business sales cycle of doom. Sales cycle of doom. Right. Like a, a roller coaster ride. It's a, it, I mean, I totally mentioned not. roller coaster rides. Boom, boom, up and down. <laughs> exactly. Because it's exactly what happens. So if, if you were selling to a Fortune 500 company and you put all this effort into selling and then you got the deal, well, great. Get started right away because they're going to pay you a ton of money. You can dedicate all your resources now to, to really knock it out of the park for that one client. But with a small business, they don't, they don't and can't pay you enough for that, right? You have to keep on selling all the time. So what happens is people sell, 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 sell. They get a deal. They get so excited. They get just completely focused on that one deal. It drags out. It takes a little too long to sign. It finally signs. They go into scramble mode to figure out how to fulfill it. And then what happens? All of that time, they stop prospecting and selling. So then they get that one deal, they get it done, they spend all their time fulfilling and trying to figure all that out. Next thing you know, they're starting the cycle all over with an empty funnel, right? That's the S&B sales cycle of doom, right? <laughs> and so you've got, you've got to do everything you can if you want to be successful in this business or any business where you're selling to small companies, you've got to get out of that. And the way to do it is separating sales and fulfillment like you just described, and and when you when you first told me that, which was on one uh, webinar we did, you know, a couple months ago, where you first mentioned that language that you use to postpone the actual start of the work, I think that's so brilliant. And everybody in this industry needs to be doing it because not only are you getting yourself out of that sales cycle of doom, 
but you're also enhancing you're also enhancing your positioning yeah. as a sought after expert. Yeah. We are busy. We can't just drop everything to start when you decide that you finally want to sign a check. Okay? When you sign your check, you will be placed into the queue where our other work already exists, right? And that creates again this positioning that only further enhances the desire to work with you. Right? Because when you put somebody off a little bit like that, all of a sudden they start salivating and go, wait, 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 why can't I get yeah. started right now? What happened? You know? I thought I was in control here. Now you're telling me, wait a minute, you're in control? So it just makes people want you even more. So I think it's a it's a brilliant strategy. I love it. And, and let me let me just everybody that's on the line here, um I, I don't haven't done that dozens, but literally through my own memberships and those I've trained, I mean hundreds of times. Um, I've gotten feedback that there is zero resistance to that as long as you say it uh, from that perspective. So uh, you're right, that psychology, that neurolinguistics programming is built yeah. built into all that. So so now we've got um, now we've got the, the 30 days. So what you're going to do is you're going to really ramp up that momentum, and yeah. then come the 30 day mark when you start fulfilling. What are some strategies that you kind of see, or some mistakes that you think people you know right away? Any any hiring techniques, outsourcing te techniques, anything that kind of help them make that, that transition a little bit easier? Well, yeah, I mean, um, so I, I think one of the things that's really important to consider is hiring any any outsourcer is just like hiring uh, an employee on your team. I mean, if you're going to work with them long term, you should invest in a relationship with them. You should know what they do well, what they don't do well. You should measure how they are doing their work like you would measure an employee. So I think I think it's important. A lot of times, I think people think, "Oh, it's a it's an outsourcer. Great, I'm just going to hand over everything, and then it's you know hocus pocus. It's just going to happen, right?" Well, no. I mean, there's still work that you've got to put in there, and I think that it's important that people realize you know you've still got to invest in that relationship. Um, the other thing is, I you know I I always just recommend I, I get people who come to me all the time, and they're like, "Mike, you know, how do I find a a, a good somebody to work with for you know reputation marketing? I love David Sprague's system." You know, how do I find somebody that can do that? And I always just say, look, just go right to David Sprague. Go ask him. I mean, you know, David is, is literally living and breathing this stuff all day, every day to a level that, you know, I can't and I don't. Ask him because I'm sure that he knows either the right outsourcing options or he offers it himself or he can tell you, you know, hey, here are my best students that I think would probably take on clients to help you. So I, I always tell people, hey, go right to the source. Don't don't try and hire some unknown entity and then train them up on David Sprague's system. Go well, right to David Sprague. You, you, know, you know what's brilliant about what you just said is what we in the very beginning. I just love how all this ties together, man. It's just so exciting hanging out with you here. Um, it's because it's about following a system, yeah. and and if you follow someone like Mike or myself or Joe Troyer or someone that is doing it every single day, they have a process, they have answers to your question. If you buy a shiny object or you buy someone that's a big guru and, and they, you know, they developed it, in, in, but they're not in it every single day, they're not out there really you know, doing the marketing themselves, they've kind of built that. Or as someone that isn't doing it successful, they don't have staff, they haven't hired before, they haven't fired in the last 30 days anybody, they haven't hired anybody, this going to be very difficult to get those questions answered to get over the hump. But my biggest suggestion in getting over that hump going from sales to fulfillment is what Mike said in the very beginning, is make sure you follow someone with a system because that system will be able to get you over that hump. Because see, outsourcing, in my opinion, isn't something you do. Outsourcing is a privilege that you have given your company because you have the right systems and processes in place that you can outsource it to your teenager, your neighbor, in the next state or around the world and or another company completely. It doesn't matter like Mike just said. But the point is outsourcing is a privilege that you get for your company when you have those systems in place. But if you don't have a system in place and you don't know how to do it, then forget outsourcing. The best outsourcing on the planet is not going to do you any good because they're just going to screw it up because they're not going to understand the philosophy, the process, the systems. They're not going to understand any of that. And if they create their own, you're not going to understand it. And it's eventually broken before it even begins with. So you haven't set it up properly. And so I think it's the 80-20 rule, Mike. It's you know 80% of all the stuff that happens, but it's a 20% that's the most important. And let me kind of end this by saying this. Um, in 
is that that 20% is all in the setup. The most valuable thing you can do is set everything up correctly because when you set it up, everything else falls right into place. So when, when Mike said, look, you set up by changing your language in the beginning, position yourself from salesperson selling a product to consultant with a bigger plan, a bigger picture for them. That's setting up from the very beginning to yeah. have systems already in place so that that's already set up. You don't have to worry about that. So when you've got that process in place, when you have that language in place, when you have those systems, everything else, the secret in my opinion is just do the work. Two hours <laughs> a day marketing. Follow yeah. the process. Yeah. You're, you're asking them. Here's, here's another thing I, 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 I really want to stress to everybody. You're asking them to invest $500,000, $2,000 in you to give them a return on investment. My suggestion is you invest in yourself as well and you go and you get in a mentorship program, you get into a mastermind, you get into an accountability program, and you invest in yourself in your own business. Now make sure you're going to get an ROI. Make sure those systems are built. Make sure they can follow up with that system. But those that have been a part of my genius mastermind, or Mike's masterminds and his training, they've got unbelievable results because they just don't have a bunch of training and a bunch of software trying to figure it out. They, can, they have someone to go ask the tough questions to. They, they get those aha moments. They really have someone they can connect with. They have communities built around them where they can ask other CEOs. So if you're going to be in this business, make sure that you take some, that some of that money. This is why you sell, sell, sell in the very beginning and invest in making sure you get part of a program that will follow up with you or that will um, make sure that you get the tough questions answered. Because sometimes it's that one little question that just, you know, it's that one little speck that just seems so huge and we can't get to anything else until we get that answered. And literally, I can answer that question, Mike can answer, our staff can answer that question in literally seconds. What would take days of just stumbling over to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's such important advice and something that I feel so blessed by, you know, the community of people that, you know, just in the last year, I mean, really, you know, I just started Local Income Lab just about a year ago. And all of these people that I know and get to associate with now, you, you mentioned Joe Troyer and you know, just all these other, you know, great people that I spend time with. And then there's, you know, a, a whole nother mastermind that I've been a part of for years that I spend, you know, crazy amounts of money to be a part of, but it's so valuable because I surround myself with these people who have learned the things I'm trying to learn already, already experienced them and can pass on that knowledge to me. And it's something that I only wish I had done more of and started earlier um, because the, the benefits are just so so huge. So I think it's, it's great advice. Yeah. I mean, go out, find people who have done what you're trying to do, who have had success with it, listen to them and, and, and do what they say to do. And then, and then, you know, the thing that you mentioned there is just so important. Take action every single stinking day. Even mm -hmm. if you don't feel like you know all the answers, even if you don't feel hundred percent confident, you know, all of that stuff comes out of, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. I'm a big believer in man, put yourself in motion get going and a lot of that stuff will come to you. The answers will come. The confidence will come. But if you just sit there in your house and just stare at your computer screen and don't do anything and don't talk to anybody and don't take any chances, it, you know, you're not going to get too far. So brilliant. Well, Mike, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me and, uh, and really some fun. unbelievable insights. Uh, and I just, I'm so thankful for the impact that you're making in other lives and families lives as well about helping them really figure this out because there really wasn't anybody around to help me figure it out or or, or you figure out we kind of you know have, have had to go through all the hard knocks and I know it's your vision as well as mine to make sure that those that are actually building a local marketing business to go make an impact locally that that our our excitement is to see you guys successful is to you go out and impact entrepreneurship to really help other businesses more importantly to help your own family and your online income as well to, uh, to go out there and do something you're excited about because I tell you, there's not many things you can, I think you can look back on your life and you know, maybe be a doctor or brain surgeon or something like that to go, wow, I really made a difference. I really help people. And, and so Mike and I are very dedicated to doing that and I hope that you'll also take on that same mantle and vision too. So Mike, I, any, any final words? Of, matter of fact, let me ask you, Mike, all these cool little things you do, I have never even seen before. Can I do a, Can I do an open webinar with you? And, and, and could you bring some of your cool stuff to to show us? Would that be okay? 
Yeah, of course, absolutely. Okay, so we're absolutely. going to do you talk about the audit. And I know yep. you got a you know you got a webinar system and all, all that. So you, you bring that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. good. It'll be a show and tell with Mike Cooch. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's always fun connecting with you. Um, I love doing stuff like this. Hopefully, you know, we, we make a difference on somebody and and uh, you know help help them achieve their goals. And like you said, I, I I just I love that about what we get to do every single day. I, I'm such a believer in entrepreneurship and the impact that it has on people's lives and and their communities. And so everybody out there, you guys are doing an amazingly important thing, and it's important that you appreciate that. Get out there and hustle. And you know, take the knowledge that you have, take the value that you can provide, and spread it out there. Um, that's that's an incredible thing. I right, well, that's the best advice. I I, we, I think we had the whole the whole uh, train here. So <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Mike, and thank you guys for uh, showing up and hanging out with us. And we'll talk to you real soon. All right, thank you, David. Take care. Bye bye.